Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of FitRx. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Dennis. And as you probably know, with me just doing what I do, being in this space, I'm all the time reading books and coming across, um, you know, different books and things in this area. So I came across this book, read it very well written. And so luckily, I was able to get the author. Uh, so Tatiana Kay is with me today. She's a registered dietitian. Um, and she wrote a book. Actually, she may have written several. Have you written several books? Two. Thank okay, you. We'll, we'll talk about that. So the one we're going to talk about today is called Hungry for Truth. Uh, ditch the lies about dieting and discover the truth about longevity nutrition in a world of misinformation. So amen to that. Uh, so anyway, we will get into her book. Uh, so uh, Tatiana, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Greg. It's a pleasure. And I'm so happy you found my book because I've put a lot of love and effort into it. <laughs> okay. Well, perfect segue. Tell us about that. So tell us about just kind of you, uh, about you, what you do, and then um, just what was your motivation in writing this book? Yeah. So I've been a dietitian for about five years now, and obviously worked in the clinical setting first, saw the errors there. And then I moved into an outpatient a gastroenterology practice where I fell in love with the gut, because as we know, a lot of conditions do stem from the gut. So I work with GI patients right now, primarily, you know, I see a lot of IBS SIBO, um, at this point, but I'm actually transitioning into more of a health coaching for women, just because that's something I love to do because it's more than just what we're eating. It's about our mindset, our sleep and so on. So I'm transitioning into that right now, but during COVID, um, I had a lot of time, you know, I got sent home from work and I wanted to write a book. And I was already writing Hungry for Truth. Um, I already had the idea of, I want to debunk all of these myths <laughs> that you hear out there, because that's the thing. There's so much controversy with nutrition. And I wanted, I wanted to be the one that figures it out. <laughs> um, and so I, I did start writing Hungry for Truth. But when the pandemic really hit, I had a lot of time to actually work on myself. My own mental health um, journey really began there. And actually I found that a lot of patients also have more struggle with mental health than actually eating well. So then I took a segue into writing code of a healthy mind, um, pre predominantly from, for my female patients, because I found that it wasn't, it, they weren't missing the knowledge. They were missing the belief system that comes with being healthy. And so I took a segue from hungry for truth, wrote code of a healthy mind, because I felt that was more pertinent in that time. And then I came back to hungry for truth towards the end of the pandemic and finished that one up this year. Okay. Yeah, no, no doubt. We, we do some weight loss at our clinic and, you know, there's no doubt it's a, a lot mental. Um, and, and especially I feel like patients keeping the weight off, sometimes we can get them to lose the weight, but keeping the weight off, you have to deal with the mental aspect or you're just not going to have long-term success. So. Right. Um, so let's get into the book. Uh, so you, like you mentioned, you kind of um, uh, kind of debunk uh, a lot of things that are out there. And and so the first one that you talk about is you say, and and, and these are all, I guess, kind of lies that you talk about. So the first one is it's it's not my fault or, or it is my fault, but it is, is the title of it, uh, which is the lie. So uh, talk about that a minute. Yeah. So again, I found a lot of my patients were blaming themselves for their poor eating behaviors, but the chapter is essentially reminding people it's not necessarily their fault that they're eating poorly. I mean, they're surrounded by junk food. They're surrounded by an easy lifestyle where they actually really don't have to move their body. Um, so I always like to remind people, it's not your fault that you live in the most abusogenic environment ever in human history. Um, but what's interesting about all my lies is you think, oh, well then they're, they're blame free, but there's a caveat there. It's still, it's still their responsibility to make changes. So even though it's not their fault that they currently have poor eating behaviors, it's still their responsibility to now increase their awareness and do something about it. They don't have to blame anybody, but they can step up 
and make changes to support their own well being. And that comes with a lot of courage, a lot of intention setting. Um, so, so yeah, essentially it's not necessarily anyone's fault that food industry puts vegetable oils in our products that they put added sugars that they've gotten so many people addicted to the artificial sweeteners like aspartame (laughs) it's not necessarily our fault that agriculture has just blown up that we just have poor quality animal products it's not our fault that the government has now gotten involved and you know taken paychecks and passing out paychecks so none that's not anyone's fault that's just a general general citizen of the U S right. And so, but they do have to make sure that it's important that they're not just going with the flow, going with the narrative that they have to think for themselves at this point. For sure. Um, the next one is I'll be happy when I'm skinny. (laughs) What's that all about? Yeah. And I, I personally, this one, this one really spoke more so to me because I have been like obsessed with my body image in the past, especially as, you know, a young person in my twenties, you know, I wanted to have the abs. I wanted to have like the perfect body. And I thought, okay, once I'm there, I will be happy. So most of these beliefs I have had myself. Um, and I know a lot of women struggle with this because that's primarily who I work with. Um, you know, a lot of them think, oh, well, once I lose 20 pounds, I'll be happier. Or once I, you know, X, Y, Z, I'll be happy, but that's external happiness. Um, and external happiness is very fleeting, um, versus if we do go deep down inside and find the joy and gratitude from within that sparks long lasting happiness. And so that's what that chapter is all about that. You're, you don't have to wait to be happy um, until like once you're a certain number on the scale, you can be happy right now in your current body. And actually, if you choose to practice self-love now, it's going to be so much easier to lose weight um, in the process of self-love. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Good advice. So uh, next one is I know everything about nutrition. <laughs> yeah, I love that one too, again, because I've been there where I was, I really did think I knew everything and I'm more prone to pride and arrogance. So this chapter makes me laugh because I've been there, you know, and I love the Dunning Kruger effect. I talk about that in the chapter where, you know, people that know just like a little bit of a certain topic, they have a lot of confidence. Oh, I know so much about that topic. So they, they are usually the really loud ones that go off and tell everyone how to eat. But then the more that you learn, the more you realize, oh, there's actually way more to this than I realized. And so that's when most people enter into this valley of despair where, oh, well, I don't know anything. (laughs) And then over time, again, as you continue learning, confidence continues to build back up. And that's when you become more so enlightened um, and you're not as loud, you're not as arrogant about it. Um, And so I think a lot of people nowadays, especially with social media, with just nutrition being controversial, a lot of people are still in that peak of stupidity is what they call it, where they know a little bit, but they they don't realize that there's so many other little caveats when it comes to nutrition, like an individual human being with specific conditions might not be ideal for the carnivore diet Mm -hmm. or, you know, someone who is um, very stressed out and has a crazy lifestyle. They might not be ideal for a certain diet. So people that tend to be very, at least with my perspective on the world, a lot of people who are very loud about nutrition they tend to not know very much. Um, so, so in that chapter, yes, it's, it's all about the Dunning Kruger effect and how, you know, a lot of people think they know everything, but honestly, we just still have to keep an open mind when it comes to nutrition and eating well for each individual person. Yeah, for sure. It's very individualized. I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure you would agree. There are certain, um, you know, universal things that would apply to everybody like limit vegetable oils and, you know, Mm -hmm. processed sugars and, you know, things like that. But, uh, short of that, it's very individualized. Um, and, and there's just, it's, it's, there's so many external factors involved. It's just difficult to have really good studies, you know, to Mm -hmm. look at when it comes to specifically to, to nutrition, because there's just, it's, you don't almost have to put somebody in a box for a certain amount of time and deliver them their foods but 
it, again, there's so many just external variables. It's just, it's difficult to do. So. Right. And, and that would lead us into, yeah, chapter four, um, which is, yeah, the low calories or eat fewer calories lie where like, yeah, in the clinical trials, um, people were incentivized to eat low calories and sure they lost weight. I mean, if you look at just the research, a low calorie diet is the best way to lose weight, whether it's low saturated fat calories, low carbohydrate calories, people lose weight on low calorie diets. Now, does that translate to the real world where, where people have real life stressors, where people, you know, aren't getting incentivized to follow a low calorie diet? And so that's where I, I don't really like when my patients count calories because it, there's that piece. And there's also the fact that a calorie is not a calorie, you know, yep. calories from avocado versus calorie from soda, completely yep. different. Yep. 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 I agree on all that. Um, and, and shouldn't be a foreign concept to my listeners. We, you know, talk about that a lot as the, the, the next chapter, which is eat six meals a day, uh, I've talked about that, but, but, uh, you know, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I would say a lot of people still believe that six small meals a day is the best way to eat. It's it honestly, it still surprises me that people will come in telling me their diet and they say, I eat small meals throughout the day. Like I'm supposed to. And I say, oh, well, we're going to get rid of that belief here really quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so the next one, uh, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts because we, we might have a little bit of disagreement. We'll see. Uh, okay. But you, you talk about carbohydrates and you say, um, you know, that, that carbs are bad. And, and I wouldn't necessarily make that statement that, that carbs are bad. However, I do tend to advocate a, a more lower carb diet. However, um, I probably just because of what I do have a little bit of a skewed population. Uh, a lot of people are insulin, and especially in the Midwest. I mean, where, well, it's probably higher here in America, one in three people have insulin resistance. Um, and, and so I focus a lot on carbs, but, um, I'll quit talking. Tell me your thoughts on, on specifically on this chapter. Yeah. So I put that lie, that chapter title to be intriguing, right? Cause yeah, most, most patients, again, when they come in, they'll be like, oh, I can't eat carbohydrates or I'm trying to lower my carbohydrates. And because the people have this belief that carbohydrates are essentially bad. Um, however, I, again, fall in the middle with most of these topics where yes, processed carbohydrates, refined sugar, um, those ones, yes, we should be minimizing as much as possible. And if you're able to get it out of the diet completely, you know, kudos to you. Um, but I also believe that, you know, there's a very essential carbohydrate that the human body needs. And that's where, I don't know where you're, you stand with this, but fiber. So plant fibers, vegetables, fruits, um, beans, all of these fibers are necessary to feed the microbiome, which I work predominantly in gut health. So that's where, you know, we're always talking about fiber, the different types of fiber to support their specific GI condition. And the thing is fiber is technically a carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, the lie being carbs are bad. Technically, not all, all carbohydrates are bad. There are absolutely some we should be limiting, like soda, juices. I mean, any liquid sugar, we should be minimizing as much as possible. But carbohydrates from plants, I think there is a place for it. And yes, with maybe diabetic patients or if someone's trying to lose weight, then we monitor and you know we count to see, okay, how much could we get away with um, per meal? Yeah, yeah. So kind of what I do, and, and you can, uh, um, you know, let me know your thoughts on this, but you know, if, we're, if somebody's trying to lose weight, if they're insulin resistant, and a lot of times I check fasting insulin levels. And so a lot of people yes, have, me too. yeah. <laughs> and, and so a lot of people have, you know, again, especially here in the mid Midwest, they have high fasting insulin levels. So it's going to encourage the calories that they eat, you know, to be stored. And so I try to get people and I talk a, a lot about it on this show to become metabolically flexible. I don't know if you mentioned that word yeah. in your book or mm -hmm. not. I can't remember. So uh, you know, people are eating so many carbs in, in our society now that that's all their body is knows how to burn is carbs. And so I like getting them to the point where their, their, their body learns uh, how to burn fat for fuel. And, and uh, once they're, and so obviously to do that, you got to lower the carbohydrates and pretty significantly. And, and of course you can do that with intermittent fasting as, as well. And I think that that's a great compliment. Um, once they get to that point, then I mean, I think adding in carbs are fine uh, and you just have to realize um, kind of what that carb threshold might be and, and, and you know, not eat too many, but still, 
you know, maybe uh, you, you need to stay metabolically flexible by, and you can do that by adding muscle, working out, intermittent fasting, limiting carbohydrates on certain days, things like that. So that's kind of the approach that I take. Again, it's, as we were talking earlier, it's very individualized, but I feel like that the, the low carb diet, not for everybody, but initially to, to become metabolic, fle metabolically flexible is a good thing. Um, as far as the fiber and stuff, um, I, and I know you're in GI and don't, uh, you, you can't throw anything at me because we have a computer, but I, I feel like the, the fiber, not that it's bad for you and greens look, greens are fine. I mean, they're, they're not really going to spike up an insulin. I mean, I tell people, if you want to eat greens, eat as many greens as you want. I do feel like it's a little overrated. Um, fruits in particular, I don't feel like that we need four to six servings of fruits, you know, and all this mm -hmm. stuff. And, and especially, you know, if you look from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, you know, we, well, maybe in California in, in the Midwest, you know, we didn't have fruits available several hundred years ago and beyond 365 days a year, you know, there wasn't a Walmart. So I think this idea that we need fruits all the time, I just don't buy into that. I, again, I think seasonal fruits, if you're metabolically healthy is, is okay. Um, but obviously the fruits are going to jack up the blood sugar and, and do all this. Um, and, and so anyway, uh, what say you? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely agree with you. And I think it depends on where people are coming from genetically, right? If they're coming from a place where it was predominantly animal products, animal protein, then yeah, maybe in fruit wasn't available, then yeah, fruit probably should not be as a big staple in their diet. And I agree that, yeah, we should not be having four to five servings of fruit per day. I mean, usually I highly recommend berries, you know, since they're lower, um, carbohydrates overall, but I would say my population that I work with, they, they're already eating poorly. So for them, for me to take them from cookies to fruit for dessert, it's like one step. And then from there we go from fruit to seeing where their, um, you know, where their weight is going, where their blood sugars are going, but personally for the metabolic flexibility, I, that's where I recommend the fasting. I would rather my patients do fasting than cut out fruit. Um, so I always start with the fasting because I feel like that is going to bring insulin down faster than just cutting out all their carbohydrates, because I know my patients struggle when it comes to that restrictive mindset, which is why I also wrote the code of a healthy mind, because I want my patients to get away from a dieters mindset, which is restrict, stop eating to a health mindset where it's okay. Well, yes, I know this food could impact my insulin. I know this food could spike my blood sugar. I know this food can cause weight gain. So I'm going to eat it in moderation, or I'm going to save it for a treat instead of eating it alone at home in front of my TV, right? There's a context that comes with eating those foods that are less healthy. Um, so, so for my patients personally, I work on getting from that restrictive mindset to the health mindset. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with that completely. Um, I've tried to get away from a, you know, a, a diet per se, because what I've found in, in doing this for several years is that when people are on a, a keto diet, um, per se, um, you know, and then they have a bad day. Okay. And they go eat a birthday cake and ice cream. And then they say, I can't do this keto diet, screw it. Uh, so I'm just going to go back to the way I was eating before. Um, and, and so I, I try to educate people. So exactly what you're saying, if they have an understanding of what the food is doing to them, you know, what's healthy, what's not, hopefully that sets them up for more success long-term. Correct. Yeah. And, and yeah, same with, I, that's why I'm, I'm for keto for certain patients, but then yeah. not keto for other patients, because I know that they're, they're extremists, right? They're very good, but then they go binge and, you know, they say, mm -hmm. forget it. I'm just going to eat all the carbs. And then that can actually do damage to your body. There was only one study that I found that, yeah, going from keto to a very high carbohydrate diet in one day, it can actually destroy the arterial wall. So I don't hand out ketogenic diet just to anybody. I have to clear the patient first, make sure they're not going to go crazy and binge if they have a bad day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Uh, okay. So next chapter, you talk about eat less fat. Um, this, you know, should not be anything uh, new to my listeners, um, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, what, what do you talk about in that chapter? I would say, yeah, a lot of people are starting to catch on that fat is good, especially, you know, our healthy fats from, you know, olive oil, um, avocados. Um, so most people are catching that fat is good. However, I still feel there are some people out there that 
are, have that old mindset where they believe all fat is bad, mm-hmm. right? They, yep. they believe this lie that fat causes heart disease right. that causes yeah. elevated cholesterol, you know? Yes. And so that's kind of why I had to keep, keep that chapter in there just because a lot of people still have those, those incorrect belief systems where in reality, our, the human body thrives on fat. Our brain is made up of fat, you know, our, all of our cells are made up of fat. So we need to be having dietary fat in the diet. And especially as a woman, you know, I very much encourage those, you know, eating more of those healthy fats, even though there's technically more calories, you know, that's where I have to then again, debunk the whole calorie in calorie out method that those calories aren't necessarily going to cause them to gain weight. Yeah. Yeah. No, couldn't agree more. And, and there are so many people because that lie has been, you know, somebody I heard the other day, I read a quote, you know, if you tell a lie long enough, it becomes truth. And that's exactly what has happened with fat. And so it's, yes, especially some of these older patients, when I start telling them to cook with real butter instead of, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, vegetable oil, they're just, you know, it, like I, I may have to tell them five times on different visits, you know, because they're like, well, I, they just, it's, it's hard to, to wrap their mind around that. Absolutely. I know. It's so funny when patients are asking me, I can have butter. And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> How are you going to make your vegetables taste good? <laughs> Heck yeah. Uh, all right. So this next one, and, and, and we may uh, have a little bit of disagreement on this one as well, but eat more protein. Um, so uh, tell me, tell me your thoughts on that and I'll tell you mine. So. Yeah. So, I mean, I, so I started in the fitness industry. So I was a personal trainer before I became a dietitian. And so in the fitness industry, it's very high protein. Everyone's obsessed with protein and what I call protein mania in the book. And so I was also, you know, very much trying to increase my protein, having, you know, protein snack every two hours to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. I was very much into building muscle. Um, until, you know, it's funny because this, this longevity researcher, Dr. Walter Longo, um, very popular. He came to my school when I was still in this mindset. And I remember hearing his lecture on low protein diet. And I thought he was nuts. I was like this again, I was stuck in that Dunning Kruger effect where I was thought I knew everything. (laughs) And I thought this guy was nuts. Like there's no way low protein diet can help cancer or whatever. Over the years, I have done a lot of, you know, my own research for longevity, nutrition, understanding that yes, high protein diets actually can speed up aging. And, you know, any animal that we've studied that we put them on a low protein diet, it actually extends their lifespan. Um, And similar to fasting where, you know, if we, if we fast, you know, mTOR isn't activated um, and and whatnot, we, we uh, get autophagy and whatnot. So later, you know, go, go down the road three years and I see Walter Longo's book. And I said, oh my gosh, this is the guy that came to my school. And now my beliefs align more so with him um, in, in the fact that, yes, we need to lower proteins to activate autophagy in the body. And if you think about it, protein sends one message in the body, grow, which is great for bodybuilders, which is great you know, for children, which is great for pregnant women. But for people who are just you know, generally healthy people that aren't trying to like be body bodybuilders grow is not necessarily a good thing. Grow could be gr- obesity, grow can be cancer. And so personally, I, that's where I fall somewhere in not complete veganism, but monitoring the protein intake to not, you know, overdoing it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with Dr. Gabrielle Lyon? No. Okay. Um, yeah, look into her stuff. She's got a bunch of YouTube videos out there. Um, she's actually a DO. I've had her on my show before. So she does something called muscle centric medicine and she's getting really popular now. I mean, she's been on a lot of podcasts and stuff, but, um, I, and even when I had her on my podcast, it was like a year or so ago, that's really when I started and, and I'm a weightlifter. So, you know, I'm familiar with the whole high protein stuff and, um, but I've really, uh, there's more people coming out with this idea that muscle equals longevity. And they've quoted some studies about, you know, the more, the more muscle you have, you know, it it equals longevity and you're going to decrease risk for, for all kinds of things. Um, The other thing I would say, and I'm sure you know this, that, that muscle is a very metabolically active tissue. And so 80% of our postprandial glucose is going to be taken up by the muscles. Unfortunately, nature works against us. Uh, You know, we lose muscle as we age. And so, um, to fight that, we 
in, in my opinion, what we have to do, I tell patients this all the time, you need three things. You need optimal hormones, which unfortunately decline as you get older. Um, you need adequate protein intake, uh, and, and then you need some kind of resistance training, you know, to maintain and or build those muscles. And so specifically with the protein, um, I feel like people, most people don't get enough in my opinion, I mean, especially as we get older and especially if they're trying to eat healthy because they're eating more salads or not that there's anything wrong with that, but, uh, they're just not getting enough protein. And so I typically recommend, which I think was a little bit higher than yours, but I recommend about one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass, assuming you're active. That's about what I try to get. Now I do a lot of weightlifting and stuff. That's assuming you're active and exercising. Um, however, on, on all that, and, and, and um, I'm familiar with everything you're saying, and hopefully my we're not going too much down a rabbit hole here. My, my listeners have heard a little bit of this, but I, you have to balance the mTOR and the AMPK systems. Okay. And so you're absolutely right. If you're pounding protein and never taking a break day in and day out, constant growth, 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 growth. Um, but the muscle is important. So I think you got to have some of that. And so what I try to do is balance those systems and on certain days, eat a, you know, a lot of protein, especially the days that I work out. Um, mm -hmm. yes, I'm getting that mTOR, I'm getting that muscle growth that I want. And then other days, maybe when I'm not working out, I'm fasting. So I'm switching to that AMPK. Um, so that's kind of how I balance all that. There's, um, I feel like there will probably be more research come out on that. Cause there's, there's just, I don't know if maybe controversy is the word I was going to say controversy. So a little bit of controversy on, on mTOR and AMPK uh, mm -hmm. the systems, um, and, and so I guess my other thought on that is, yeah, maybe you'll gain a, some longevity, decreasing protein, but at what cost and how much are we going to gain? And I don't think we know the answers to that. Um, so those are my thoughts, uh, comments. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I think it, it really comes back to that individualized diet for a patient and looking at their lifestyle. Okay. Are they doing resistance training or are they just trying to eat protein? A high protein diet because everyone else is, um, versus yes. Yeah, so if we're talking about an athlete who is actively building muscle or even a lay person who's just wants to build muscle for longevity, increasing protein on those workout days is essential. You know, at least 30 to 40 grams after that workout is what I recommend my patients. And especially if they're doing a fasting regimen on top of that, I mean, having, you know, 30 grams of protein with each meal is, you know, they're, yeah, they're going to be struggling to get enough protein, like you said. Um, so there are some people that need more protein if they're depending on their lifestyle. Are they fasting? Are they, are they actually even doing resistance training and, and so on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, we'll move on. Um, so you mentioned you have to go vegan. So you have to be a vegan. Obviously. Yeah. So That's this a, is the lie. This is the other side of the argument. So basically I, I really do take the middle ground. That's what I found when I was writing this book is there are truths to both extremes. There is truth to the carnivore diet. There's truth to the keto diet. There's truth to veganism, but are they true completely? Not for just the general helpful health, um, the general public. I would say it's very individualized at that point. So veganism is missing a lot of nutrients, as you know. Um, so it's very, it's not natural for the human body. Um, it's more of a thing that people do nowadays because we're bored. I mean, we have everything in this current culture. We have our, you know, housing, we have our food available at the snap of a finger. So personally, I don't feel like the vegan diet was natural for humans, you know, going back a thousand years ago, no one really ate like that because it is missing so many nutrients. Um, so that chapter is just all about, you know, the missing nutrients in the vegan diet and why it's not necessarily healthy. And it's not personally my, my recommendation for patients to go down that route. Oh yeah. It's way down on my list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so. And it's so weird. I have patients that come in and they're vegans and I mean, I don't convince them to start adding meat in, although I do have a couple of patients that did start adding animal products back in eggs, um, a little bit of chicken, and they started feeling way better. So I just have to say, yeah, they're probably missing some nutrients in their diet. Yep. That's making them feel that way. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, okay. Um, avoid salt, coffee, and booze. Yes. Uh, I wanted this one to be <laughs> a little fun. Um, 
Yeah. And I think, I don't know if you've, um, looked into, yes, the whole salt controversy where, you know, everyone's bit, yeah. told to go on a low sodium diet. And I hated this when I worked in the hospital, when I had to go give low sodium education to cardio patients, um, unless they're in heart failure, then I feel like it's appropriate then, or if they have cirrhosis, but in my opinion, it, they're too far gone at that point. Um, so just trying to make dietary changes when you're at the end of your life, um, that's why I left the hospital and decided to work in an outpatient facility, but sodium. Yes. We have such a poor, um, idea about sodium. We think sodium is bad, but it's really the context of sodium. Are we getting sodium from burgers and fries? Or are we getting sodium salt from adding it to our vegetables that we're cooking at home? Um, so, so that's where I, I, I wanted to debunk that whole lie about salt and that sodium is bad. We, we do need salt, the human body, the blood is salty, <laughs> you know? So we, we need salt, um, just, just to balance our electrolytes in the body, but the other half of sodium is potassium. And so if a patient is trying to reduce their sodium for blood pressure reasons, I ask, well, well have you looked at potassium? And they say, no, no one's ever told me about potassium. So that's when I encourage them to increase potassium. So that way sodium and potassium can actually balance each other out. Okay. Um, so, uh, coffee is the, the fourth macronutrient. And then I guess we could say booze is the fifth. So, uh, talk, right, about, right. talk about those. Yeah. And I, okay. So my patient population, they love their coffees. So, you know, their morning coffee is usually the hardest thing for me to change because it is a ritualistic thing. I think morning coffee, it just gets people in mood. And so I wanted to just remind people, you don't have to avoid coffee to be healthy. And actually, you know, there are some longevity studies that show coffee actually supports longevity and same with alcohol with the red wine. Um, although a lot of people actually disagreed with me on the booze section, because a lot of people think that no one, you should be abstinent from alcohol, but I kind of fall somewhere still in the middle where, you know, if you are going to have alcohol, obviously have it in moderation, do not be binge drinking because binge drinking is absolutely going to just destroy the body. And does alcohol impact your sleep? Yes, it does. It impacts your sleep in a negative way. So we have to be careful there. So if you can drink earlier in the day, that would be ideal. Um, but also I go into the way that, you know, people used to drink wine back in the day where they actually water down the wine. Um, and if you, you know, water down wine, winer, winies are going to freak out if I say this, but you know, if you water down wine, it's going to give you more volume, um, but won't impact it won't be giving you as much alcohol. So that's what I recommend in the book. I'm not sure if anyone has tried it yet. I personally do it. You know, I, I try to, if I'm going to have wine, water it down just so I'm not getting as much alcohol, but have more volume. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all that. I, I certainly love my coffee. I drink it black. I don't put anything in it. Me too. Um, and um, I love my booze. <laughs> that sounds terrible. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not an alcoholic, but uh, it, you know, I, I enjoy a drink and, and I do a lot of the things you're saying, I don't water down my wine, but if, um, if there's one thing and I've, I've got a, a whoop strap that attracts my sleep. And so I've had it for years. So I, I know by now what affects me the most, as far as my REM sleep, my quality of sleep and things like that. And mm -hmm. it's, it's alcohol late at night. So if, mm -hmm. if a rare occasion, we're going out with friends, we're out a little later than normal. I'm drinking, like I'm going to get a red score on my whoop, you know, cause it, I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with that, but it gives you a red, yellow, green, basically. Uh, and, and I'm going to be in the red, meaning, you know, my body, I didn't get a good night's rest. My body didn't prepared. And so, um, I may have one drink and I have it pretty early. And then I also encourage people if they're going to do that to try and limit the, the really sweet drinks with the sugary drinks. Of course. And, um, you know, if you're going to drink a, a red wine, like, you know, the, the Cabernets and stuff, they're not as sweet or, um, you know, I like, maybe like a, a bourbon, you could put bourbon on ice. That's not for everybody, but uh, you know, which is a, a very um, just a, not a very sweet drink. And so uh, mm -hmm. now obviously I don't, you don't want to have too many of those. Cause then you're going to, that, that's when you really, are, it's going to take a deep dive the other way, um, you know, for your health. Right. So anyways. yeah. And also on top of that, um, I was going to say that um, what I recommend my patients that are drinking is to, as soon as you get home, if you're, if you are going to have a night of, on the town drinking, try to drink on some electrolytes right before bedtime. That way you're replenishing. Cause that's the reason why a lot of people feel like crap the next day is they've 
basically depleted all of their electrolytes. So I always recommend my patients, okay, drink as much water as you can get those electrolytes in to replenish and you won't feel as bad the next day. And I personally feel that helps me. I don't know if you've tried it and seen the whoop results by drinking electrolytes before bed. Yeah. I don't think I've tried it. It's not something I do very often. So, um, but yeah. I, don't, I don't think I've tried that. So, um, very good. Um, okay. So your last chapter is forever young. And so talk about what that looks like. And then also with that, with, with you doing this, writing this book, having this knowledge, always like asking people about kind of what their daily uh, regimen looks like. And, and so just kind of take us through, um, your lifestyle as far as maybe what you eat, breakfast, lunch, dinner, what a workout, you know, looks like for you, just what that looks like. Yeah. So I personally also do fasting. Um, I started fasting a few years ago and I noticed my weight just trended down to, you know, the weight I've been wanting to be at. Um, so I must've had some insulin resistance going on. So I lost weight really quickly and has, have maintained it relatively very easy. Um, and all the thing that kept me going with intermittent fasting is my mental clarity. So I'm actually still in the fasted state. It's almost three o'clock here. Um, but I feel so good when I'm in the fasted state. So intermittent fasting is a very big part of my life. And anyone that knows me knows that I love fasting. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, you know, I always at least do about a 16 hour overnight fast. And then some days I'll go, you know, the full day and maybe have dinner. Um, so fasting is a really big part of my life. Obviously water intake is huge for me. Um, I'm, I always am drinking water. I also like to have my black coffee in the morning. Um, I periodically try to go for decaf sometimes now, um, since I'm, you know, getting closer, I'm technically in trimester zero, which is getting my body prepped for pregnancy. Um, since we're going to be trying to have babies soon. So I'm training my body to get along with decaf coffee. So I'm drinking decaf black coffee right now. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I predominantly follow a plant-based diet where, um, I'm not a big meat eater, but of course I do have the occasional burger. Um, I like seafood. So I would consider myself more of a flexitarian where I, don't like any labels. So I will eat meat when I want to, and I will eat vegetarian when I want to. Um, so that's my, my diet and exercise wise. I am again, very, I like variety. So I always try to get weightlifting in, you know, one or two times a week. I always try to get my run, you know, at least 40 minutes to get that BDNF going for, um, you know, neuroplasticity. And then I'm very into yoga because my body very much likes stretching right now. So I always try to keep it, you know, a wide range of things, um, physically, and then yep. sleep is my most important thing. Um, I always try to make sure I get eight hours of sleep because, yeah, if we go back when I was in college working as a personal trainer, I was getting four hours of sleep. I don't know how I survived, <laughs> but now I feel so much better. It's so much easier to just manage things that are irritating. I don't get major anxiety anymore. Um, and that really all came from sleep. And also I want to say fasting helped with that too. Okay. Any sleep hacks that you do or like, yeah, I mean, I wear, I, I do the basics, you know, I've read, um, Matthew Walker's book. So, um, I have the blue light blocking glasses. Um, of course I try to make the house as cool as possible possible. Um, I try to go to bed at the same time every day, wake up at the same time every day. Um, I am the type that can have anxiety once I get into bed. So meditation helps, um, deep breathing helps. Um, and also meditating throughout the day, um, is very useful for someone who has more of an anxious brain where thoughts come in. And, and as soon as you hit the pillow, you know, those thoughts come in to get your attention. So meditation has been very helpful for me, not just before bedtime, but really throughout the day to improve sleep. Okay. I'm curious what your opinion is on organ meats. So that's been one of the changes I've tried to uh -huh. uh, incorporate this year. Uh, you know, the more I learn and do all this, you know, I just I kind of learn things as I go. And so I'm, I'm learning more about the importance of organ meats. So you know, trying to, again, incorporate more of that in my diet. Now, mm -hmm. I, I hate the taste of liver, even though I've been trying to eat more liver. Um, we have a cow coming in here pretty quick. And so we're keeping a lot more of the organ meat. So we're doing the spleen, we're doing the thymus gland, we're um, doing the heart, which the heart's actually really good. That's uh -huh. not really a big deal. But anyways, trying to eat more of that. I had somebody on my show not too long ago, 
um, uh, actually kind of looked a lot like you, young, attractive woman, but eats a lot of organ meats and, and wrote a book up specifically about cooking organ meats. Uh, the, the name of the book Amazing. is it, it, it Takes Guts, I think is the name of the book. But anyway, uh -huh. just with you being a dietitian and stuff and, you know, kind of studying this stuff, just wondering what your thoughts are on, on organ meats or if that's something you incorporate at all. I mean, I highly recommend organ meats. I mean, not to my patients, but like to anyone that's willing to eat it, I would absolutely incorporate it. I personally, not my forte. Maybe if I cooked it right, maybe if I read her book and learned how to cook it, make it taste good, maybe I would be more open to it. Um, I know for my babies, like I'm for sure feeding them liver, <laughs> like 100%. They, they won't know, you know, they're sure. going to be little children. So I know for my children, I'll absolutely be giving them the organ meats, specifically the liver. Um, since that seems to be more, more accepted than mm -hmm. yeah, eating yeah. heart. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I haven't, I haven't journeyed through that. Um, although I'm sure one day I will get to that point to yeah, try yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, yeah, we, um, so when I, when we cooked the heart, I smoked it and I have a 10 year old daughter and we didn't tell her, we just cut it up. Of course she couldn't tell it looked like a steak and it actually tastes similar to a steak. I mean, it's got a little bit different texture and she liked it. She ate a bunch. And then we told her afterwards that, Hey, you know, you just ate heart, you know, and anyway, she was, she was like, I can't trust you guys. And it, was, <laughs> it was pretty funny. So that's uh, cute. Yeah. Well, very good. Uh, okay. So your website is, um, vitamin K which is K E A Y.com. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Is yes. that the best way people can get a hold of you, contact you, find the book and all that? I imagine the books on Amazon as well. Yes. Yeah. They can definitely go to my website and they'll see all that there. Um, also on Instagram, I'm vitamin K R D. Um, RD is for registered dietitian. Um, so if you want to find me on Instagram, send me a DM there. Um, that's I'm, the door is open for anyone that wants to have a conversation. Perfect. Okay. Um, anything else before we wrap up? Um, well, d do you want me to give my one tip? Yes. Or? Yes. I was getting ready to ask you. I just wanted to make sure you, you didn't have anything else. So, uh, yeah. So I always ask my guests, give us one tip, uh, you know, that could make us healthier today. What would you say to that? I would say to set time aside every week to just journal and reflect on your current health status and where you want to go. Um, I have a lot or I recommend people write out what their healthiest self looks like. What does she feel like? What does she look like? Um, that way, you know, what you're striving towards, you know, what is your intention? Are you trying to get off all the medications? Are you trying to, you know, prepare for pregnancy? So having an intention is very powerful, but also having that weekly reflection, I, I have found it to be very helpful for me and my patients that I see every week. It, they succeed way further than the ones that I see once a month or once every six weeks. So a weekly check-in with yourself, it doesn't have to be long, 20 minutes, you know, just set a timer and free write about how you're feeling about your health status, about your habits, about your behaviors, even journal about your limiting beliefs about certain things about your body, um, and, and food. If maybe we have poor relationship with food, those are all important things that you need to write down because if not, they'll just kind of stay in the subconscious and, you know, we, we won't be improving as faster as, as, as fast as we would like to. Sure. Okay. They're very good. Great advice. Okay. Uh, well, Tatiana, I really appreciate your time with us. Uh, appreciate Thank everyone. You. Appreciate everyone listening and uh, we will talk to you next time.